Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Alveolar gases can help us differentiate between the different pathological states in the lung. Alveolar oxygen is lower in these two conditions. There is alveolar hypoxia. While it is higher in diffusion impairment and the last condition. Alveolar carbon dioxide is increased only in ventilation impairment. So, if we could estimate alveolar gases, in fact, it is a very non invasive procedure and is quite easy to do. Just that the machine is not widely available, and I do not understand why. If you look at arterial oxygen saturation for which you need to take an arterial blood sample, it is an invasive procedure. You find that there is arterial hypoxia in all these states. So, if you know the alveolar oxygen concentration, you would be able to differentiate between the different states. And this will allow you to compute alveolar arterial oxygen difference. Arterial oxygen is always lower than alveolar oxygen. The number is called AA oxygen difference or AA oxygen gradient. There is a normal value to that. And if the value is higher than that, you would understand that there is diffusion impairment. So, estimating alveolar oxygen will not only help you differentiate between the states, it will also help you compute alveolar arterial oxygen difference to confirm whether there is diffusion impairment or not. Likewise, alveolar carbon dioxide can be a very useful lung function test too. Unlike arterial oxygen, which will always be lower than alveolar oxygen, Arterial carbon dioxide is always equal to alveolar carbon dioxide. I have said before that this is a very important concept in respiratory physiology. Except in extrapulmonary shunt where arterial and alveolar carbon dioxide may be different, the two are identical in all other clinical situations. Therefore, you could use either one as surrogate for the other. Logically, one would think that arterial carbon dioxide estimation is an invasive procedure. You need an arterial blood gas sample. So, why do not we estimate alveolar carbon dioxide and use it as a surrogate for arterial carbon dioxide? That would be the most logical thing to do. But estimation of alveolar carbon dioxide, though it is a non-invasive non procedure, the equipment is expensive and the machine is available only in intensive care units. Having understood the value of alveolar gas concentrations as lung function tests, we will see the method by which alveolar gas concentrations are estimated. So, there is an oxygen meter and a carbon dioxide meter available commercially. Um, this is an infrared carbon dioxide meter, it is called a capnometer. Now, these two meters get a sample of the air that you breathe in and breathe out through a pump. Now, this does not have to be a tube in the mouth. You can even breathe through your nose as you would do normally and a small tubing stuck to the outside of the nose will help deliver a certain percentage of the air that you inhale and exhale, say 10 percent. There would be a small pump here which sucks in 10 percent of the air that goes in and out and deliver it to the meters. Now, let us see what would happen to the reading in these two meters during inspiration and expiration. Let us take the case of the oxygen meter first. When you inhale, you are inhaling atmospheric oxygen. That air would then go through the airways and enter the alveolus. So, during inspiration, because you are constantly taking in atmospheric air, the oxygen meter will give the concentration of oxygen in atmospheric air. That would be 160 millimeters mercury. During exhalation, 
initially air from the airways that is air from the dead space will be exhaled and that you notice is pure atmospheric air. So, during the initial part of exhalation the oxygen meter will still read something equal to atmospheric oxygen maybe slightly less it would be about 150 millimeters mercury because water vapor would have been added in the airways and that occupies a part of the oxygen space slightly less than that and subsequently some alveolar air will start coming out along with dead space air and you will breathe out a mixture of dead space air and alveolar air. So, oxygen concentration will be less than what you find in atmospheric air because remember alveolar oxygen concentration is only 100 whereas atmospheric oxygen concentration is 160. So, from 160, 150 because as you exhale alveolar air is being mixed with dead space air, oxygen concentration will decrease and then ultimately when you breathe out pure alveolar air, oxygen concentration will be equal to what you find in alveolar air. So, if you take the concentration of oxygen at the end of exhalation, what you call end expiratory oxygen, that is representative of alveolar oxygen. That is how we measure alveolar oxygen concentration. The same thing applies to carbon dioxide. Let us see what happens to the reading on the carbon dioxide meter during inspiration. You are taking an atmospheric air, atmospheric carbon dioxide is 0. Therefore, throughout inspiration you have the carbon dioxide meter reading 0. Then when you exhale, initially you will blow out what was there in the dead space that again is atmospheric air, you would not find any carbon dioxide. Then you will start getting a mixture of dead space air and alveolar air. By dead space, I mean air that is in the airways, trachea and bronchi, which does not participate in gas exchange. So, during the latter parts of expiration, carbon dioxide concentration in the exhaled air will increase as more and more of alveolar air escapes. Ultimately, in the last part of expiration, pure alveolar air comes out and then during the next inspiration, carbon dioxide will go down to 0. In the last part of exhalation, the values both in the oxygen meter and carbon dioxide meter will represent alveolar gas concentrations. That is the way in which we estimate alveolar oxygen and alveolar carbon dioxide. Note that it is totally a non-invasive procedure. It is either called end expiratory PO2 or end tidal PO2 and end tidal PCO2. ETCO2 is another term, end tidal carbon dioxide. This is a surrogate for alveolar carbon dioxide. That is the only way in which we can estimate alveolar gases. Now, what would be surprising is that though this method is so simple, this instrument is not available in the wards or the OPD. A capnometer is available in the ICUs only and in fact an oxygen meter is not even available in the intensive care units. I really do not understand why and if you want to estimate alveolar oxygen concentration while an oxygen meter is not available in the ICU, it is done with the use of what is called the alveolar gas equation. We will see that in the next lecture. So, though alveolar gases are useful lung function tests and the method by which you can measure alveolar gases is fairly simple and non-invasive, those machines are not routinely available in the wards and OPD. Capnometers are available in ICUs and oxygen meters is not even available in the clinical setting. It is available only in uh, the research setting. So, alveolar oxygen concentration is at 100 millimeters mercury and alveolar carbon dioxide concentration is at 40 millimeters mercury. This is at the end of expiration. When you inspire fresh air, you will notice that alveolar oxygen concentration will slightly increase and alveolar carbon dioxide concentration will slightly go down because the air that you breathe in 
has a higher concentration of oxygen and zero carbon dioxide. However, we won't be able to measure the alveolar gas concentrations at the end of inspiration when you have taken 500 ml of air over and above the 2 liters of functional residual capacity that was there in the lungs. Because the change in lung volume is quite small during a tidal breath, we should assume that the changes if any to the alveolar gas concentrations are minimal and because there is no way we can measure end inspiratory levels of the gases, we will not comment on them. The only values that are measurable are at the end of expiration which represents alveolar gas and therefore these are end expiratory gas concentrations and we will assume that these concentrations do not change much even during inspiration. We have seen this table already. We learnt that alveolar oxygen would be low in ventilation impairment and atmospheric hypoxia would in fact be higher than normal in diffusion impairment and extrapulmonary shunt. What about alveolar arterial oxygen difference? We saw that arterial oxygen is slightly lower than alveolar oxygen in the general case and the difference between the two is what is com computed as alveolar arterial oxygen difference. This value if it is more than normal, we will see what the normal value is later on. If it is more than normal, you know that there is diffusion impairment. What about carbon dioxide? The lesson we learnt is that arterial carbon dioxide is always equal to alveolar carbon dioxide. There is no difference between the two. Only in extrapulmonary shunt because after blood goes through the lungs and enters the systemic circulation, Extrapulmonary shunt is a shunt here where blood with more carbon dioxide will be added to blood that returns from the lung. Therefore, arterial carbon dioxide concentration would be higher than alveolar carbon dioxide concentration. But extrapulmonary shunt is a rare event and in all other clinical situations that is ventilation impairment and diffusion impairment, arterial carbon dioxide and alveolar carbon dioxide are equal. That is very important and they can be used to substitute one for the other in certain equations. So, there is no difference between arterial and alveolar carbon dioxide. So, in a, even in any form of lung impairment, alveolar and arterial carbon dioxide values are equal. Let us see how we would go about differentiating between these pathogenetic mechanisms in the lung. We would first do an arterial blood gas analysis, look at arterial oxygen and carbon dioxide concentrations. If arterial oxygen is low, we call the condition arterial hypoxia and if it is low enough that is less than 60 millimeter mercury, we would call it respiratory failure. This happens in all of these pathogenetic mechanisms. If you look at arterial carbon dioxide, it could be low or high, normal or somewhere between 40 and 50 millimeters mercury. If it is higher than 50 millimeters mercury, we call it type 2 respiratory failure or ventilatory failure. Arterial carbon dioxide is low in these two conditions that is diffusion impairment. If you look at lung pathogenetic mechanisms, you could classify them into ventilation impairment or diffusion impairment. Carbon dioxide concentration in the arterial blood is actually lower in diffusion impairment, whereas if it is high, it indicates ventilation impairment. It is either normal or not too high in extrapulmonary shunt. After this, if there was a way of estimating alveolar gases using the meters that we just saw, then we can compute alveolar arterial oxygen difference from the alveolar oxygen and the normal value for the age is this is a very crude equation, age by 4 plus 4 millimeter mercury is the normal value for the alveolar arterial oxygen difference. If somebody is aged 40, 
40 by 4 is 10, 14 millimeter mercury can be the difference. That is, if somebody has an alveolar oxygen of 100, the arterial oxygen can be up to 86 millimeters mercury. That is what we mean by normal for age. In ventilation impairment, alveolar arterial oxygen difference is normal. Whereas, if it is widened, say in this person aged 40 years that we just discussed, if arterial oxygen is only 70, let us say, while the alveolar oxygen is 100 millimeter mercury, then we know that the difference is widened. And if that has happened, we know that there is diffusion impairment. We can also differentiate between the conditions depending on the response to supplementary oxygen. The response is best in atmospheric hypoxia, but there will be some response in ventilatory failure and diffusion impairment as well. In fact, the response to supplementary oxygen will be better in ventilatory failure than in diffusion impairment. However, it is very wrong to give just oxygen in ventilatory failure. It could even be fatal. We will consider that later. If there is no improvement in arterial oxygen with supplementary oxygen, then we know that there may be an extra pulmonary shunt. So, in this paradigm, we see it is a good idea to estimate alveolar oxygen with the kind of meters that we discussed. And we also went on to see that oxygen meters are not available in the clinical setting. While capnometers meters are available in the ICU setting at least, oxygen meters are not even available there. Then how do we estimate alveolar oxygen while we do not have an oxygen meter? Is there a way clinicians get past this impediment of not having an oxygen meter? They are, they are still able to estimate alveolar oxygen with the alveolar gas equation. The alveolar gas equation allows you to compute alveolar oxygen even when there is no oxygen meter or even a carbon dioxide meter. Thank you for your attention.